All right. <clears throat> Buddhism, uh, as we already discussed earlier, is a world religion already from India, Sri Lanka, uh, Southeast Asia, but also around the world, including the United States of America, Europe, Australia, Africa. So it's a world religion. Uh, Buddhism is also very uh, strong and predominant religion in uh, parts of Southeast Asia, especially the mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, we talk about uh, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, in particular, but also uh, in parts of uh, island Southeast Asia, like parts of uh, Malaysia, uh, and Indonesia, also in Singapore. I talk about the history a little bit before, the geography, um, the key <laughs> teachings of Buddhism, and the Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism, <laughs> right? Uh, and this Mahayana Buddhism, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, Vietnam, uh, a little bit, uh, talk about it a little bit later, but in 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 Indonesia, uh, Buddhism um, has spread from at least uh, you know uh, seventh century or uh, and later, uh, especially after uh, Hindu kingdoms and you have the Buddhist kingdoms uh, until fourteenth century. And then from 14th century, you had the influence of Islam. So Islam in many ways replaced uh, Buddhist and Hindu traditions in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia, um, in the Indonesian archipelago. Mom, my mañana don't eat heavy because I need to do two essays tomorrow. And I don't want to wait to do exercise super late. And then I have a meeting. Okay, I'll, I should mute. Oh, we get up at A and do it. <laughs> Let me rise again. There. Okay. Oh. All right. In Indonesia, you have uh, uh, different uh, different uh, Buddhisms, <laughs> different branches of Buddhism. Uh, Mahayana Buddhism uh, has been uh, strong. Uh, from the early times, but then you have had also the Theravada Buddhism. We uh, remember the four, four, uh, the four noble truths, right? The life of suffering, uh, there is a cause of suffering, desire, there is an end to suffering, and there's the path to end the suffering. And you also, um, you know, uh, have some basic understanding about the three characteristics of existence, uh, suffering, impermanence, and uh, no self. Then we kind of talk about uh, the scriptures, the three baskets, yeah, the Tripitaka scripture, especially among the Theravada Buddhisms, uh, because the Mahayana Buddhisms also uh, has local uh, sutras, uh, literature and other books and scriptures in local languages. So these different branches uh, and teachings of Buddhism uh, have influenced the people, the society, the ruling parties of people uh, yeah, of Southeast Asia. One of the uh, one of the uh, types of Buddhism that is quite different uh, from uh, you know, from uh, other uh, countries uh, in Indonesia, in particular, is Budayana Buddhism. Uh, Budayana Buddhism uh, is, uh, you know, is an Indonesian uh, creation. 
Uh, it is considered a pro reformist and progressive Buddhism um, led or uh, established by, by uh, Japanese uh, or Javanese Buddhist Dharma uh, Virya. So from Java, you know, Java is the island in Indonesia. A Javanese Buddhist Dharma Virya uh, he was a follower of uh, Indian Buddhist leader uh, Bhikkhu Asim Jinarakita, uh, who published a book called God in Buddhism. Uh, this is interesting because uh, in Buddhism, the Buddha is not considered God. And in Buddhism, generally speaking, uh, you don't have to uh, believe and worship a creator God. Uh, some say Buddhism in general is a uh, non-theistic religion, a religion that has no particular um, belief and worship of a God like Brahma or Shiva, for example, or Vishnu in the case of Hinduism that we already talked about earlier. However, you do have uh, conceptions and rituals and offerings um, with regard to gods or goddesses in, in different parts of Southeast Asia, mostly local gods or goddesses, or maybe um, adaptation of uh, Hindu and local indigenous uh, spiritual beliefs and practices. So you have a Buddhist who also uh, has, you know, um, has gods or goddess worship. Uh, but as a Buddhist in, in, in general, uh, the Buddha is not considered uh, a god. In Indonesia, however, especially among the Buddhayana Buddhism, because the state requires all religions uh, to have the conception of God, then they have to come up with a, you know their own conception. The Buddhists have to come up with a conception of God. Uh, that's why this book was published, God in Buddhism. Uh, interestingly, they named the Buddhist God, in this case, Sanghyang Adi Buddha. So Sanghyang Adi Buddha is this conception of a uh, particular God in Indonesian Buddhism. In Indonesia, Buddhism uh, has to have God, and prophet or books and of course community of believers or community of uh, you know a buddhist uh, like other religions such as islam and christianity so to make it uh, you know a short comment on this uh, beyond theravada and mahayana buddhism you have indigenous kind of buddhism in indonesia as a response to the state philosophy and, and you know uh, law uh, that requires uh, religion to have uh, systematic teachings, including belief in a monotheistic uh, you know conception of of, of God. In Indonesia, you have many organizations. Uh, one of the most uh, important Buddhist organizations in Indonesia is the representative of Buddhists in Indonesia, Walubi. This is an Indonesian term. Don't worry about the Indonesian uh, term. Uh, Perwakilan Umat Buddha Indonesia. But this, uh, uh, basically, this organization serves as the, as the means or as the medium uh, you know, between Buddhist populations and the, and the government. So to intermediate, uh, uh, you know, the, the function between the, the, their communities and the state of, of Indonesia. They also serve as the vehicle of all Buddhist schools in Indonesia because uh, you have a different uh, schools, different uh, um, denominations of Buddhism in Indonesia. Apart from this uh, umbrella organization, you have uh, smaller Buddhist organizations, uh, including uh, the Council of Budayana of Indonesia, 
Majlis Budaya Anak Indonesia, The Sangga Agung Indonesia, The Sangga Theravada Indonesia, The Sangga Mahayana Indonesia. Uh, as you can see, you know, Mahayana, Theravada, Buddhism have their own representative uh, organizations in Indonesia. Then you have the umbrella organization, which is, uh, you know, uh, en encompassing all these uh, Buddhist organizations that exist in Indonesia. Uh, ritually speaking, uh, of course, uh, Buddhism uh, focus on meditation uh, in the morning, um, you know, in certain times, uh, not only during the festivals, uh, you also have offerings, uh, prayings uh, by or before the statue of the Buddha. This is uh, just one, uh, one of the pictures, uh, Theravada monks uh, praying at the one of the uh, you know uh, uh, vihara the, the small temples in the capital of Indonesia Jakarta. Um, I I met and interviewed a Buddhist monk, uh, a Theravada Buddhist monk in Indonesia, a few years ago in uh, um, in uh, in one of the islands of Indonesia. When I discuss, uh, you know, Buddhist teachings <clears throat> uh, with him, uh, it's very important uh, that uh, Buddhism focus on, uh, you know, uh, understanding the self, uh, understanding the environment. Uh, he also talk about uh, the notion of God. When I ask him uh, whether or not a Buddhist believe in particular God uh, or God, uh, he responds to me that it depends on how you define God. So in other words, um, it is very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, very straightforward, but at the same time, uh, nuanced answer. Uh, it depends on how you define God. If you mean by God, for example, the power, uh, the natural power, uh, that governs uh, uh, the universe um, is not necessarily a personified God or being or supernatural uh, being uh, beyond uh, you know what you uh, have in this life, for example. So really, um, uh, that's why when he talk about Adi, uh, you know, uh, Sanghyang Adi Buddha. Uh, for example, the name that has to be given by some other Buddhists in Indonesia, uh, that's just a name, that's a label that people would uh, give, but the essence of it is beyond uh, our human understanding. So he replied that human beings cannot really understand uh, the nature of this, what we call as humans, God. So this is one of the answers that you would, uh, uh, you know, uh, get from a Buddhist monk. Of course, many Buddhists would have a different answers to the same question. But in Indonesia, in particular, you know, uh, the belief in one God is one of the things that they would have to adjust. Uh, although many Buddhists in other Southeast Asian countries uh, have a di different in conceptions, and many of them don't need necessarily believe in God. And the Buddha himself was not considered God like a creator. Uh, Buddha or the Buddha has been venerated and, and worshipped not as a creator God necessarily, but as an enlightened being, uh, as a weakened one. Uh, and you have different bodhisattva, the compassionate beings uh, after, uh, you know, or beyond or beside the Buddha. So you have Buddha and Bodhisattva. And of course, uh, Buddhists have different images and status, uh, different representations of this Buddha and the Buddhahood. Uh, one of the festivals, uh, Buddhist festivals across Southeast Asia and all over the world is uh, the Vesak Buddha or the Vesak Day. Yeah? The Vesak Day uh, commemorating the birth, the enlightenment and the uh, uh, the reaching of Nirvana uh, of the Buddha. 
the birth, the enlightenment, and the reaching of the nirvana of the Buddha. Uh, in in uh, Indonesia, uh, the Buddhist religious festival has become an official national holiday. Uh, in other words, you know, it's national holiday, uh, not only for the Buddhist. Uh, this is one of the um, uh, rulings, um, you know, um, uh, practices in Indonesia to commemorate the birth, the enlightenment, and the reaching of the uh, uh, of the Buddha's nirvana. In Malaysia, okay, let's move to uh, Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is the neighbor country of Indonesia, um, smaller in terms of the number of population and smaller in terms of the size of the country. But Buddhism is also quite uh, uh, significant, uh, even more significant, uh, comparatively speaking, because uh, it is uh, the second largest religion in Malaysia. Even though Malaysia is uh, a state that uh, stipulates Islam is the official religion, uh, but it recognized constitutionally uh, the existing religions, including Buddhism. So 19 to 21 percent of the population are Buddhist, uh, mostly uh, Malaysian, Chinese, uh, as well as uh, Thai, Buddhist, Sri Lankan, Burmese, uh, and also Indian uh, Malaysians. So ethnically, uh, Buddhism has been uh, adhered by uh, different ethnic groups in Malaysia most or even uh, all Malays are Muslims, all Malays are Muslims in, in Malaysia, 60% uh, uh, of the population. But others like Chinese uh, and others, uh, they are uh, either uh, Buddhist uh, and you also have other religions, including uh, Hinduism, uh, Confucianism uh, and others. So, it is a significant minority religion in Malaysia, about 20% of the population. The number of population around, uh, it's around um, uh, 30 million. Uh, Indonesian populations around, it's around uh, 260 million. So just below the United States in terms of the number of population uh, when we talk about Indonesia. So it's much bigger than Malaysia. Malaysia around 30 million, Indonesia 260 million. So just to have you uh, a sense of the size of the countries, Indonesia and Malaysia. They are neighbors. Uh, they were colonized by different uh, colonial powers. The, uh, Indonesia was colonized by the Dutch. Uh, Malaysia was colonized by the British. So this is how uh, the countries uh, became divided into two because of different colonial powers. But anyway, when we talk about Buddhism, uh, you know, you have uh, Mahayana Buddhism in Malaysia predominantly. In Indonesia, you also have predominantly Mahayana Buddhism, but you also have strong uh, Theravada Buddhism like the Boroburu Temple, the temple that we talked earlier before, uh, representing the Theravada Buddhist tradition in the early times. Uh, one of the states of Malaysia, which has a significant uh, Buddhist question. population uh, is Kelantan. Oh, yes, please. Um, um, I seen a question in the chat back when you were talking about the Buddhist monk that you had interviewed. Does being a male have anything to do with being a Buddhist monk or can females be Buddhist monks as well? Uh, do you have it in your chat too? Oh, sorry, I didn't uh, read it. Uh, let's see. Okay, can you repeat your uh, question? Uh, I, I still cannot uh, see the chat. Sorry, the question was just, um, are all the monks male? Oh. Can a female be a Buddhist monk as well? I see. The, okay. We will talk more about uh, male and female. Mostly uh, monks are male. Okay. Uh, and you have now uh, an increased number of uh, Buddhist nuns as well, female. Uh, you know, there is still some uh, debate and some discussion and negotiation uh, 
uh, to what extent that female nuns, you know, as actually uh, true Buddhists uh, among some of the, uh, you know, Buddhist uh, monks. Okay, but predominantly male. Okay. But you could have a, a Buddhist uh, female as well. Uh, we will talk about women and gender. Uh, we will discuss a little bit about that. Okay, but that's okay. a really good question. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. No, that's good. That's good. No problem. Okay, no problem. I just didn't see the chat, so that's why. I kept, you know, I kept uh, talking. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, um, so we will uh, go back to uh, the issue of women. All right, uh, for now. But that's that's a good question. So Buddhism in Kelantan. Kelantan is one of the uh, states. is is close to Thailand. Uh, in fact, uh, this part of Malaysia, it's called Kelantan used to be uh, one of the regional cultural metrics called uh, Patani. So Patani, so you have, uh, because uh, this part was colonized by the British and the Siam uh, king, uh, kingdoms, then they divided. So the Patani was divided. So partly uh, become a Thai, uh, you know, a, a nation state and partly became the Malaysian nation state. Yeah, that's why Kelantan was predominantly uh, or there's a Buddhist uh, uh, impact in, in this particular area called Kelantan. I visited Kelantan and, and then you have, you have uh, uh, you know, the, the, of course the, the temples and, and, and uh, the status of uh, the Buddha. One of the famous, uh, important uh, Buddhist uh, status in, in Kelantan in Malaysia uh, is this one. Uh, so it's a sitting uh, Buddha, sitting cross leg as a lotus flower uh, with one hand lying down to the ground and the other on his lap. Um, it is quite recent, uh, but it is quite uh, important. And Thai and Chinese Buddhist influence, you can see here uh, in this predominantly Malay uh, state, uh, Kelantan in Malaysia. So anyway, it's a sitting cross leg, you know, sitting uh, Buddha uh, that you, you know, you see how uh, the size of, uh, of uh, the Buddha. But you also have in this particular state uh, in Malaysia, reclining Buddha. So reclining Buddha, you can find everywhere uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, here in Malaysia, uh, you know, reclining Buddha, uh, you can see the size. Uh, in, in proportion to us, so, you know, and during he, this is uh, to depict uh, the Buddha uh, about to enter the very nirvana, the final nirvana, uh, during his last illness. So you have uh, the sitting Buddha, the reclining Buddha, you also have standing Buddha. So you have different positions of Buddha representing different. Uh, episodes of the Buddha's life. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's move on to Cambodia. Uh, one of the uh, important uh, icons of uh, Buddhist and uh, Buddhism in Southeast Asia in, in Cambodia through the Angkor Wat. Uh, but Angkor Wat used to be a Hindu temple and then became Buddhist uh, because of the uh, you know, the change of the ruling parties. So when the, the kings change, then, you know, the, the, the supports for the religions uh, oftentimes also change. Um, you know, the rulers or the rule, the, there's, a, there's a saying, the religion of the people is according to the religion of the king. Um, it might apply to this. Uh, so it, it's considered uh, Mahayana Buddhist uh, temple, uh, Angkor Wat is a complex, and it was by the Mahayana Buddhist king, Jayavarman VII. Um, and you have this uh, magnificent uh, Buddhist complex, uh, although you have, of course, a reminiscence of the, you know, of the Hindu and also uh, Buddhist uh, uh, images here in this particular complex. All right, so I just give you um, this uh, basic uh, understandings of uh, you know, the temples uh, and also some information about Buddhism in Indonesia. 
we don't really talk about the elite and the popular uh, religion that we consider toward the quarter, right? So I will talk about popular religion in Southeast Asia. So what does it mean? What does it mean when we say that um, you know popular Buddhism, right? Popular Buddhism in Southeast Asia. What does it mean? Um, is it about the monk, the the male monk? Um, is considered uh, you know the, the 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 monkhood is considered elitist, uh, for example, or uh, we talk about um, the people, right? The the Buddhist people, the, you know, the lay persons, the ordinary peoples, who might have uh, practices and beliefs uh, according to the ancestors or belief in the ancestor spirits and worship, for example, or maybe worship also uh, uh, Hindu gods or local gods, uh, besides being a, a Buddhist or influenced by Buddhist tradition. So some scholars suggest the term syncretism. Syncretism, like a mixture or a blending or a combination of different elements into one. Um, so Hindu elements, Buddhist elements, local elements become one and it's a syncretism. Um, you have this concept, right? You have the concept. Some uh, use this concept, others don't like this concept. Uh, they, they like the other concept like uh, hybridity, you know, hybridity, like cultural hybridity, where you uh, basically as a person or as a group of people incorporate different elements, different cultures from outside wherever the sources are and become one. And you don't really see or do, you don't really feel, uh, you know, which elements come from which source and it's called hybridity or hybrid culture so when we talk about religion you know we need also to discuss these terms syncretism hybridity uh, there's another term acculturation you know acculturation or assimilation or adaptation different concepts to understand what's going on when people become religious you know so uh, you know the elite and the popular religion are one of one of these such concepts that uh, our uh, you know textbook uh, discuss, but basically when we talk about popular religion, popular religion, uh, you basically have this uh, ordinary way how people themselves believe and worship, regardless of the elitist, uh, you know, scriptural, textual, sometimes male-dominated uh, institution, right? And another thing that they might also uh, emphasize when we talk about popular Buddhism is the extraordinary powers like the ma magic amulets, uh, you know, the use of certain uh, objects in order to make you strong or, uh, um, you know, invincible, for example, uh, and so on and so forth. Another aspect of popular Buddhism is festivals. So people do festivals, perform festivals. Uh, sometimes without the attendance of the elite, uh, they do the festivals they, in their own ways, the ceremonies in their own ways, incorporating different traditions, cultures, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's why it's called popular again. And one of the concepts is syncretism. And some even add to this inclusive syncretism. In other words, syncretism that is not exclusive and that is not only limited to certain uh, you know, particular elements, but it's everything like open uh, culture. Another way is the pilgrimage to, um, uh, you know, visiting uh, the image of the Buddha. Uh, and one of the practices among this popular religious uh, people is uh, with holy water. And of course, they, they do the water as a sacred, they, they consider the water sacred, holy. They call the spirits, they, all, they give offerings to the deities. When we talk about deities in the Buddhist you know, popular tradition, it is the local deities as well as the deities that might come from uh, India or Sri Lanka or other uh, places. So again, the elite and popular traditions in Buddhism um, that we always talk about throughout the quarter. 
one of the popular traditions is again and again veneration or you know uh, a worship of spirits in burma and thailand for example uh, even though we don't uh, necessarily have to agree on the terms animism or animistic uh, but we use this uh, just to you know to simplify uh, a spirit belief uh, side by side with the buddhist rituals uh, so in other words you know spirit uh, ghost uh, magic uh, strands are embedded or or uh, blended uh, coexisting side by side and in the in the in the mind and the practice of the people they don't they don't see these different practices spiritual beliefs the beliefs in spirit and the buddha uh, as contradiction right one of the shrines at Maknat uh, Shrine uh, in, in Bangkok, uh, Thailand, and you also have the Tree of One Handed Corpse, the Erawan Hotel Brahma, which suggests this uh, impact of magic and belief in ghosts uh, in these shrines. Uh, your textbook uh, discusses more about you know, um, this uh, element, this topic of magic and ghosts. Uh, in, in Thailand in particular. Then you have the worship of the rice goddess. Um, the rice goddess, of course, remember we'll talk about Southeast Asia, right? Rice. Um, and that's why you have uh, a, a quite uh, a sig uh, you know, uh, important uh, veneration uh, worship of the rice goddess. And the dragon, of course, uh, Naga, um, the, the importance of uh, serpents, uh, you know, in the religious belief and traditions, as well as other supernatural beliefs and practices. Uh, so, Burma, Thailand, uh, but also other places in Southeast Asia, in Laos, in Cambodia, uh, as well. So, the academic question then, <laughs> um, for us, uh, when we use the term syncretism, um, it's this one. Um, when we talk about popular Buddhism, do we talk about syncretic Buddhism or just simply say Buddhism? You know, it is a Buddhist culture or so Buddhist practice. We don't necessarily say syncretic religion or syncretic Buddhism. So scholars don't really like the term syncretic, uh, syncretism. Again, I already mentioned about hybridity, right? hybridity uh, and one more term is localization uh, or vernacularization well this new term vernacularization is making something foreign local making something from outside vernacular uh, in terms of belief practices languages you know institutions so make thing uh, local and vernacular and that's why some people don't, uh, some scholars don't want to use uh, syncretism. They just want to use other terms that represent the more complex reality. So between syncretic or just Buddhist. And some say, well, what is Buddhism in Thailand? Uh, is it uh, whatever Buddhists believe and do that is Buddhist? Uh, and that's one of the questions. You don't really have one answer to the question. Um, so when we are when we are asked about what is Buddhism in Southeast Asia, uh, you can say Buddhism in Southeast Asia is syncretic because uh, peoples use different elements, including uh, belief in spirits and worship in spirit and spirits of ancestors, and then local gods and other goddesses and so on. So you use that term syncretic in order to suggest different influences, different elements, different sources of their beliefs and cultures into their own, right? One, one way of saying it, but you have to defend why you like the term syncretism. Others answers would be like, no, people just consider themselves Buddhists, uh, regardless of the sources of their belief and practices, regardless this particular belief and practice, you know, coming, from India, from Sri Lanka, or from other, uh, you know, Orthodox, for example, uh, uh, 
Theravada Buddhism, for example, or it this comes from the ancestors uh, from local areas, from the villages. In other words, they, they, they see themselves as Buddhist, uh, period. They don't like to use, well, we are syncretic. We just are Buddhist. Uh, um, and we incorporate all this into one and in our tradition, our culture, our life, way of life, right? So you, you, can, uh, you can answer the questions in different ways. Yeah, as long as you can justify why you like the term syncretism or, or hybridity, or localization uh, and so on and so forth as long as you can justify uh, it is fine yeah uh, according to the authors of our textbook um, thai popular religion involves much more than textual buddhism so again when we talk about popular buddhism we talk about uh, more than just textual buddhism in other words they don't necessarily bring with them uh, the Pali Canon, the Pali Scripture, the Tripitaka, right? The uh, Tripitaka, uh, Sutta Pitaka, Vinaya Pitaka, Abhidhamma Pitaka, you know, the three baskets, the scriptures, right? That scripts uh, that, that uh, the priests or the monks usually uh, would bring or, or, or recite. The people don't necessarily have that text, okay? Um, so more than textual Buddhism, because this popular religion, popular Buddhisms would include other, you know, other deities, Hindu, Buddha, uh, Buddha is, uh, is Hindu divinities, uh, local spirits and gods, uh, you know, all these things, amulets, power, magic, and other things, including recently, they incorporate, you know, tradition with sign Valentine Day, for example, and incorporate red roses and so on. So in other words, you have a mixture of everything uh, as they see fit into the cultures and that's why they are not necessarily textual or scriptural uh, or elitist. This is why uh, scholars like uh, uh, Winsler talk about popular Buddhism in Thailand, in Cambodia, in Burma, as well as in other places, all right? Okay. Um, I, uh, you know, I would like to see if, uh, if we can have uh, pollings now before we move on, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to uh, prepare a polling so you can uh, answer. Let me, uh, okay. You can see, uh, I will launch the poll. So this is... Uh, the question is on uh, Buddhist Four Noble Truths, yeah? So just answer one, uh, one only, select one, okay? All right, you can go ahead, uh, voting. Which one is not one of the Four Noble Truths? Life is suffering. The cause of suffering or desire, there is no end to suffering, the effort path to end suffering. Which one is not? Yeah, the Four Noble Truths. Each cross. Okay. A few more seconds. Until I see uh, the majority have voted, then I'll stop and uh, end the poll. All right. So, here the answer, uh, oh, uh, share the result. Yeah. So which one is not? Um, so most of you, 68%, uh, there is no end to suffering. So that's the correct answer, all right? So uh, according to the four uh, noble truths in Buddhism, 
there is an end to suffering. <laughs> There's hope to end the suffering. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's not one of the four noble truths. All right, good. Um, let's, uh, let's have another poll, all right? Okay. Please go ahead. This is about the three characteristics of existence in Buddhism. Which one is not, yeah, which one is not one of the three characteristics of existence? Life is permanent or life is unchanging. Life is suffering. Life is impermanent or changing. Uh, uh, there is no permanent self. Go ahead. Three characteristics of existence. All right, a few more seconds. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, so, yep, life is permanent or life is unchanging. It's not the three characteristics of existence. Uh, again, the three characteristics of existence, life is suffering. Right, then number two, impermanence or life is impermanent. And three, uh, there is no self or there is no permanent self. Okay, that's good. Okay, let's uh, have uh, another one. It is about Theravada Buddhism. Uh, okay. That's the question. Theravada Buddhism emphasizes three basket Tipitaka scripture in Pali, Vinaya, Sutta, Abhidhamma, or Nirvana as the existence of ignorance, or Bodhisattva as the goal, or the sutras and scriptures in local languages. So when we talk about Theravada Buddhism, uh, what is the main characteristic? here okay Okay, so, so this is the answer. Yes, um, the correct one is the three basket, the three pitaka, the Pali canon. So Theravada Buddhism, the, the, the way or the path of the elders would emphasize the, you know, the, the Pali scripture. Uh, it's Vinaya Sutta Abhidhana Pitaka. Uh, Nirvana, they say, uh, mostly as the extinction of existence rather than extinction of, uh, of ignorance. And the goal in Theravada Buddhism is not Bodhisattva, it's Arahat, right? Arahat, remember Arahathood, uh, the enlightened being, um, the being that already reached enlightenment. Bodhisattva on the other hand is the, the enlightened being 
we is about to be enlightened but postponed in order to help others that's why it's represent um, it's uh, described as the compassionate uh, or compassion being the buddhahood the bodhisattva where you have more in mahayana buddhism then the the scriptures in mahayana buddhism are mostly local or in in the forms of sutras you know in in chinese uh in in uh in uh, uh malays uh, in other uh you know, javanese uh, as well as other local languages uh, rather than the pali um okay <clears throat> all right so that's a that's for the the poll let's continue a few more uh and then we will uh watch uh, a video on buddhism in uh in india and southeast asia So one of the festivals, or there are some other festivals. So one of them is New Year festival. Usually in April, um, uh, this New Year festival among Buddhist, uh, especially popular religious traditions, um, in Southeast Asia, uh, they adapt uh, the the practice, uh, the the festival from uh, Brahmanism, from you know Hindu uh, Brahmanism, uh, the the practice of of cleaning, purification seeking forgiveness uh, water throwing and so on it's some um, you know this new year festival you have uh, different uh, uh, different rituals uh, involved then you have the buddha's day the visaya buddha the Vesak buddha yeah that the one that i already mentioned earlier okay the, to commemorate the birth the enlightenment and the parinirvana of the buddha usually may and june uh, you know and then you have uh, local festivals, religious festivals, like Festival of the Floating Boats, Loi uh, Katong in in Thai, in, in Thai. Uh, usually they, they do this uh, festival in November. Uh, this is to uh, to honor the the dead spirit of their relatives, their friends. So it's you know particularly to commemorate again the ancestor spirit. So I, I can as you can see uh scholars suggest is syncretic you know like they 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 incorporate to different different things including uh, hindu buddhist but not only buddhist but hindu and also local practices that's how scholars like the idea of syncretism but again people themselves who are practicing this they don't necessarily see as contradiction you know the concept of syncretism it doesn't apply to people uh, because they simply do it and they simply incorporate everything uh, you know without seeing contradiction without seeing this is this is buddhist this is hindus this is local they are and so on they don't really see that they just see that they just practice that uh, this is why a scholar used the term popular religion uh, another ceremony katina ceremony is particularly uh, with regard to uh, the relationship between the monkhood and the lay persons so it's basically you know a gift giving you know like um, giving um, and taking <clears throat> so presentation of new robes and other gifts at the end of the monastic brand uh, retreat in around uh, in mid no, uh, uh, october in in the fall uh, this is one of the ceremonies that they would do to again to emphasize a uh, harmonious relationship between uh, monkhood and the lay person the ordinary people's mutual relationship one of the chantings uh, or actually the, the the main chantings in buddhist tradition or prayers especially i take refuge you know in the buddha i take refuge in the sangha um, uh, in the dharma i take refuge in the sangha right that's the main prayer uh, most buddhists would say i take refuge in the buddha i take refuge in the dharma i take refuge in the sangha the buddha the enlightened one the dharma the teaching and the sangha the monastic order you have other versions you know longer version like this on your slide but basically it's about you know the power of the buddha the power of the dharma and the power of the sangha 
uh, regarding the image or the or images of, of, uh, of Buddha, uh, you have relationship between uh, arts and religion, yeah, uh, art and religion, art and worship. Uh, that's why you have a decoration, uh, but also religious meanings to this decoration. It is also about interrelationship between the Buddha's power and virtue. So uh, the Buddha images represent the power uh, embodied in, 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 in the Buddha, but also morality, the notion of morality or virtue, power and morality. The last point about the consecration of a Buddha image or the veneration of the images of the Buddha is merit-making ritual. It is about reciprocity, uh, you know, mutual relationship, right? Uh, mutual relationship between uh, usually the ruling or the ruler and the sangha, the monks, but also between the, the sangha, uh, the monkhood and the monastic order and the lay people. And the rulers uh, in most cases need uh, power and then uh, the power of the Buddha would be given to, you know, to the ruler and the ruler need the sangha. So this is mutual. Uh, so the, by, by building and supporting the images of the Buddha in different countries in Southeast Asia, the ruler uh, you know, would get uh, something out of it, power, ruling power, to continue to maintain their power, as well as, of course, to show they, they, uh, you know, they support uh, for the religion and their subjects, the people. All right. Uh, this is uh, a slide of one of the uh, religious festivals in Bangkok, 2006. Again, this is uh, the Fesaka, yeah, uh, Fesak, uh, you know, the commemoration of the birth, the enlightenment, and the Parinibbana of the Buddha. All right, I should end my slides here, and let's see uh, a video that uh, I already prepared for you. Um, on Buddhism in India and Southeast Asia. All right, enjoy. Uh, professor? Oh yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I had a question. The book talks about uh, Apolloism and Dionysian religions um, as a dichotomy. Uh, and I wasn't really sure what that meant as regards to the, um, when it talks about Buddhist, popular Buddhism. Uh, in which, um, in which uh, let's see. Uh, which reading that you are referring to? Maybe the new readings that I gave? Um, yeah, in uh, Popular Religions in Southeast Asia, it says that um, Sapiro talks about um, Apollo. Oh, that's, a, yeah, that's another reading. We can discuss it in uh, my, um, my <clears throat> office hours uh, on Thursday. We can discuss. That's a very important question. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, the important concepts that uh, I will uh, discuss it again later. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. For now, because uh, I'm going to show this uh, 18 minutes uh, left. Okay. Gautama Siddhartha was one of humanity's wisest teachers. He lived in the middle of the 6th century BC in the northern plains of India. He taught a message of compassion and universal love. The message spread to all corners of Asia and shaped the culture of a continent. It continues till today as one of the great religions of the world with millions of followers, Buddhism. Gautama Siddhartha was the son of Sudhodhana, the ruler of Kapilavastu in present-day Uttar Pradesh in India. He was born nearby in a grove of star trees in Lumbini, which is in present-day Nepal. 
Ashoka, the great Indian emperor of the third century BC, erected a pillar at Lumbini to commemorate the sacred site. For six years, Gautama wandered all over Bihar in his quest for true knowledge. And one day, under a people tree in the village of Uruvela, next to the Niranjana River, Gautama sat down to meditate. Finally, his mind dispelled all the darkness of confusion. He fully realized the truth of the cause of suffering in the world. He had seen the path towards happiness. He was now a Buddha, an enlightened one. At Sarnath, near Varanasi, the Buddha delivered his first sermon to his five former companions. This event is known as the Dharma Chakra Pravartana, or the setting into motion of the wheel of law. The Buddha wandered ceaselessly from place to place in present-day Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. He taught Dharma to all without any distinctions. At the age of 80, Gautama Buddha headed to Kushinagara in present-day Uttar Pradesh. There he told his close disciple, Ananda, that his end had come. Ananda was miserable and cried bitterly. The Buddha asked him not to grieve the loss of his master's transitory self. He said, Dharma, is your refuge. Over the centuries, thousands of stupas were made by the followers of the Buddha. The stupa became a profound symbol of liberation from the bindings of the material world. The greatest surviving Buddha stupa of the BC period is on top of a hill at Sanchi in central India. It is likely that it would have enshrined the relics of the Buddha. In the meantime, great caves were being carved out of the hills of the Ghats in western India. Deep within the heart of rock, the seeker was provided a haven of peace, far from the noise and clamor of the material world. Over a period of about a thousand years, more than 800 Buddhist caves were hewn out of the heart of the rock. The first phase of prolific excavation was from the second century BC till the third century AD. The fertile valley of the Krishna River was the cradle of civilization in the Eastern Deccan. This area became one of the greatest centers of Buddhism, and over 140 early Buddhist sites have been found in this region. Indeed, this river valley is a vast land of stupas and Buddhist caves. In the first millennium, great centers of Buddhist study had come up in Bihar. These had the bountiful support of Buddhist and Hindu kings, and they developed into vast monastic universities. The greatest of these was at Nalanda. It was a hub of learning where pilgrims and scholars came from all corners of Asia. In the first millennium, Chinese pilgrims traveled by sea and by land to the holy places of Buddhism in India. When they used the sea route, they spent much time in Indonesia, which had great ports. They have written considerably about the Indonesia of that time. Hinduism existed here in early times, and Buddhism flourished from the seventh century onwards. Till today, the great epic of ethics, the Ramayana, is an important cultural tradition of Indonesia. It may have arrived here by the 5th century.
In the 8th and 9th centuries, magnificent Buddhist monuments were constructed in Java. The Borobudur Stupa was built by the Shailendra kings in this period. It is one of the world's most magnificent Buddhist monuments. It is the tallest stupa standing in the world. There are many thousands of feet of very fine relief, which we see as we climb upwards and go around the stupa. The bottom level presents the life of passions in the world, the Kamadhatu. The next level presents the law of action and reward, the Karmadhatu. Rising upwards, numerous reliefs depict the Rupa Dhatu, the life and stories of the Buddha. He is the Rupa, the personification of the potential for enlightenment within us. Beyond that level come the levels of the final truth, which is formless, Arupa Dhatu. Here, there are no distractions of the illusory forms of Maya, and all that we see is the stupa. This is the final truth in all Buddhist thought, beyond all forms. From the 13th to the mid 14th century, one of the great Buddhist centers of the world was at Sukhothai in Thailand. Some of the most graceful Buddhist art was created here in a style which is famous still today. The lines of the Sukhothai Buddha figures have a vivid life of their own. The surfaces are smooth and gently curving. The peaceful expressions are sublime. King Utong founded a new capital in the mid 14th century at a location which is 85 kilometers north of present day Bangkok. It was named Ayutthaya after the city of Ayodhya, the birthplace of Rama in India. In fact, the king of Thailand personifies ideal virtues as depicted in the character of Rama. His good and moral actions are believed to create peace and prosperity in the country. Many impressive structures survive at Ayutthaya, which show the glorious Buddhist history of this site. Great Buddhist monasteries here were centers of philosophy, literature, and the fine arts. Vat Mahathat was set up as the holy center of the capital city by the king Burung Rajatiraj I. This grand complex was also the home of the supreme Buddhist patriarch at the time. Since the 1780s, numerous temples have been made and renovated in Bangkok. In Thailand, it is the divine responsibility of the king to maintain the Buddhist religion. The temple of the reclining Buddha, the Vat Po, is one of the Bangkok temples dating back to the 17th century. King Rama I expanded the temple when Bangkok was established as the capital of Thailand. The centerpiece of the Vat Po is the huge statue of the reclining Buddha, almost 50 meters in length. The most famous of the Bangkok temples is the temple of the Emerald Buddha, or Vat Kra Kyo. The temple was built from 1782 to 1784, during the reign of King Rama I, to house the Emerald Buddha. Thailand continues the gentle traditions of Buddhism. The lives of the people are permeated by the desire for the spiritual search. Till today, in the midst of the modern world, 
the spirit of compassion of the Buddha's message continues in this land. Myanmar was a great crucible of Buddhist influences and art, which came to it over the centuries. At the end of the first millennium, Myanmar had a deep and direct relationship with the center of Buddhist philosophy at Bodh Gaya in India. In fact, in the 11th century, the king of Myanmar restored the Mahabodhi temple at Bodh Gaya at his own expense. He also made replicas of the Mahabodhi temple at his own capital of Bagan. Simultaneously, in the 11th century, King Anavaratha declared Theravada Buddhism to be the state religion. To proclaim his deep reverence, he made thousands of pagodas at Pagan. It is one of the most glorious Buddhist sites of Asia. Inside the pagodas are paintings and beautiful Buddhas made from the 11th to the 18th centuries. At Yangon is the Grand Shwedagon Pagoda, almost 100 meters high. It is the most sacred pagoda in Myanmar and enshrines the relics of the past four Buddhas. Myanmar is a deeply religious country. Pagodas and monasteries have been the traditional places of worship and education here. The country has almost 500,000 monks and nuns of the Theravada Buddhist tradition. Cambodia is another land which has a great history of sacred art and monuments. The Hindu and Buddhist sculptures of Cambodia from the 6th to the 8th centuries AD are unrivaled for their sheer beauty and excellence. While the kings primarily worshipped Hindu deities, much Buddhist art was also created. In the 13th century, King Jayavarman VII built the greatest Buddhist complex in Cambodia at his capital, Angkor Thom. The face towers of Angkor Thom have become a universally recognized symbol for Angkor. The faces look in the four directions, symbolizing the universal benevolence of the Bodhisattva, Lokeshvara. The Bayon, at the center of Angkor Thom, is the king's own sacred temple mountain. It is one of the most magnificent monuments of Buddhism. South and Central Vietnam have many Hindu temples and some Buddhist temples. These were made between the 7th and 13th centuries. A Buddhist monastery complex was built at Dong Duong in the 9th century. This must have been a most impressive center of Buddhist worship in the time. The museum at Da Nang in central Vietnam has numerous sculptures which show a glorious history of art. In the center of the peninsula of Southeast Asia is the country of Laos. The people here are deeply religious and Theravada Buddhism is the basis of their culture. Monks are deeply venerated and there are almost 5,000 temples. Most men in Laos live for some part of their lives in the monasteries to imbibe Buddhist ethics and a compassionate vision of the world. Laos is a sacred land 
where ancient traditions, such as the daily giving of alms to monks, continue till today. Monks are those who have renounced the material comforts and other attractions of the world. Society believes it to be its responsibility to look after the well-being of these renouncers who have given up the ways of the world. The Golden Tat Luang Stupa is a national symbol of Laos. It was originally built in 1566 and was restored in 1953. The stupa is 45 meters high and is believed to contain a holy relic of the Buddha. Buddhism has a great vision of the eternal harmony of the world. This faith, with its message of compassion, spread far and wide and shaped the culture of a continent. A culture of peace and gentleness, which continues even in the midst of the materialistic world of today. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let me. Uh, we are being censored. All right. So you know, like as you as you can see here, um, let me go back first. I'm sorry. You know, you see the. Uh, oh, we already ran out of time. Um, Okay, so um, to respond to oh, I now I saw uh, the question uh, on chat. Uh, uh, I know we already run our time, but I just want to uh, uh, to uh, you know respond to Sun uh, about the question. Oh, Apollonian and Dionysian religion when talking about popular Buddhism. It's, it's a mythology, you know, Greek mythology, the term Apollo and Dionysus is a Greek philosophy, you know, Greek mythology. Um, and usually uh, Apollo, uh, Dionysus are considered uh, two sides of, um, of the spectrums. One is more rational, the other one is more uh, emotional. Uh, so, in other words, in popular Buddhism, there is some emphasis on the rational aspect of belief, you know, doctrine, uh, and also emotional aspect, spiritual aspect of it. Uh, so maybe that's just to, you know, to give you a very short uh, response to your uh, question. I have to re uh, refer to the, the book itself, uh, which, part, which passages that talk about this, but that's my understanding about Apollonian and Dionysian religions. Rational and emotional aspects of the uh, uh, popular religion, uh, how they uh, understand the concept of, uh, of enlightenment and how spiritually and emotionally they attach to the uh, Buddhahood and you know, the enlightened being. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, all right, um, so Please, uh, you know, uh, yes, say hi or here uh, for today. Um, thank you so much again for joining uh, the meeting. Uh, please uh, do your uh, weekly essays and you can discuss with me also your uh, longer essays if you want. Uh, but otherwise, um, stay safe and stay healthy, okay? Uh, and for now, uh, we will continue for the last part of Buddhism uh, on Thursday. Then we continue uh, lecturing on the new religion, which is Islam in uh, Southeast Asia.
Okay, I'm I'm trying to to close, but I forgot again. Uh, uh, here we go.